Yes, I'm just about to start. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you are all welcome for health and adult social care scrutiny panel. Um, <clears throat> we've just gone past 6.30 and we want to start the meeting now. Yeah, okay. So during the meeting, I think I will just wait for my colleague to get this on. Yeah, be on. If you can pass, Matt, if you pass that to her, please. <clears throat> so during the meeting, all participants will be in control of their own microphone. Please ensure that you turn your microphone on when you are speaking and remember to turn it off when you are finished. All reports published as part of the agenda will be considered as read by members of the panel. Published reports will be therefore be summarized to allow the panel to focus on questions. So um, as I said, I, um, is Councillor May, are you okay? Can, you can hear from now, okay. Excellent, thank you. So apologies for absence. Um, I think Councillor Testa did send his apology. Do we have any apologies apart from Councillor Testa? I see none. Item two, urgent business. There is usually no urgent business. And item three, declaration of interests. Members to be asked if, um, I'm asking members if you have any interest to declare, um, you say it now or not at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's one here. Okay, go ahead, um, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I know in the pack, and this has happened on other committees, I'm still, and never was, down as a governor of Charlton Manor Primary School. Okay. I'm not, so if that could be corrected in the uh, register. I don't think it's even on the register, so I'm not sure how it makes it, but thank you. All right, thank you. Is there another person who wants to declare interest? Great. Item four, minutes. Members are requested to confirm as accurate record the minutes of meeting held on the 11th of July, 2024. Um, I hope you had the opportunity to look at it. All right, okay. Any other person? Are we happy with the minutes of 11th July, 2024? Excellent. Before we go to um, our fifth item, which is vaccination rates updates, um, we also have adult social care, these are main ones, and we also have commissioning of future reports, which will be our last um, item on, for tonight. Um, I just wanted members, I. I know not all of you have read, but um, I've just mentioned that we receive a motion um, from, we have the, I think Francis Hook is um, the one who actually raised the motion on behalf of um, Reclaim NHS September 2024. And I can see Francis at the top there and then um, Helen Brown is also here. But what is it is um, the motion is um, just to let those who are members who didn't um, get the opportunity to, to it's about um, NHS um, staffing. The motion is from local reclaim the NHS supporters to the Royal Bar of Greenwich um, HCAS panel to call a halt to the employment of medical associate professionals. These are medical assistance um, to doctors, which includes physicians associates and anesthesia associates in the South East London integrated care system and our primary care network. 
and they propose um, the motion with questions they've put across. Um, a very interesting and, of course, uh, a concerned um, kind of um, motion that is very important, I will say. But I think um, um, before I ask the, the health um, director for public health to, to make a comment, um, as a chair, I think that um, this um, body or this panel will not be the, the right one to actually um, discuss this. And this is because of the fact that um, we have the integrated care service and also that of um, NHS England, who are the people who monitor these um, categories of people. And therefore, the local authority here um, will not be responsible to this group of people. Of course, this can be directed to the appropriate quarters. So I will, I will invite, um, Frank, if you can just give me a minute, I will invite the, um, the what do you call, the Director for Public Health to make a comment on this. Um, if you have also received the, the, the motion. Thank you. So I, I haven't actually seen the motion, um, Chair, uh, but I would, I would agree with the, the comments that you've just made that uh, it's, it's actually not um, the people who are, who are here this evening or, or the panel who, um, uh, who would be best placed to consider uh, from what you've, what you've said. I haven't, actually, I haven't actually seen the motion myself. Um, and, and I don't know um, from a sort of um, council constitution point of view whether a scrutiny panel can receive a, a motion and consider it from members of the public. Uh, that uh, uh, Perhaps Raymond know, knows the, the, the technical detail on that uh, more than me. Um, I've checked the legalities of the Health and Scrutiny Committee. You have got a legal, legal um, uh, duty to, for the public, the residents of Greenwich, in this case, to come and Give, uh, ask questions on the health and ask for, ask for scrutiny, and that is a legal right. I think you ought to go back to look at the part, your rights under the parliamentary uh, health, the health, um, uh, um, sorry, the uh, what's been passed over the years. The duty of the scrutiny committee has not changed. The legal duty is for the public to come and ask for scrutinising any issues to do with health, and this is what we're asking for, to, to look at it and to get, get opinions and understand. So I think you need to go back to look at the parliamentary as we have. And I wish I'd um, sent it on to you because it's a legal duty. So that the public have got a right to ask for proper scrutiny in all health issues. Yeah, thanks, um, Francis, for your, your statement. Um, yeah, I, 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 today we have two agendas, and the agendas happen not to be related to what um, the motion is about. We could consider this if it was related, but I, would, I think I would also like to invite um, um, Director... Yes. Thanks for that statement. Um, I think, um, Nick, Nick, you also had, will you want to make a comment about this before I actually make my, com my final conclusion about this, yes. You, you had the opportunity to glance through the motion, isn't it, yes? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think it's just reflecting what Steve said, really, that um, obviously seeing the motion, um, there's no one here from the ICB or the NHSE to respond to that. Um, that's the first thing to say. I think we have to check in terms of 
the motion and whether or not a motion can be brought. I didn't believe a motion could be brought to the scrutiny committee. Um, but in the context of um, what the public can do, obviously the public can ask a question of uh, council. Uh, so that may be an opportunity to raise the issues. I think there's also the opportunity to raise the particular concerns directly to South East London ICS and to the NHS as well directly. And so that may be an opportunity for Francis and colleagues to raise it in that way. So th those would be my pieces of feedback. Yes, so um, Francis, I heard you very loud and clear. Um, this uh, panel is supposed to deal with anything about health and social care, that is right. But where the bodies that control is not able to, uh, is not present to be able to address the issues that you are raising, I think that it will, I mean, there are other options. I mean, writing directly to them is one area. The other area also is a question can be put on full council. And this can be, can be spoken of, which is also an opportunity to do that. And also, we also have the opportunity, NHS England, that can also be completely um, um, addressed to. So I will say that, um, yes, it is a very important document, our statement and motion, which no, we are not saying we're not going to even think about it at all, not at all. We'll definitely be looking at it. But then what I say is today's, um, program, we do not have anything that is related to it. That's the first one. And secondly, um, you should be able to get a better res re results if you address it to the appropriate bodies that I've mentioned. And of course, nobody also prevents you from writing to the, the cabinet lead um, to, uh, to, to, to have answers so that the answer will be given and you can still come to full council to follow up with any supplementary questions. But for today's, um, um, what do you call, for our, our program this evening, um, we will be postponing this one and we are not able to listen to it tonight. Sorry, thank you. Chair, if I may, very briefly, it might be helpful to the people submitting the motion, then we can start on points one and two that you're asking. You may be able to help build your evidence base for what you want to put forward later on with an FOI request to those bodies. They seem like very reasonable requests you can make under FOI to get that data that you want to get and then build your evidence base for something to come to full council or further questions to those bodies. Thank you. Is there any other member who wants to make a comment on this? Mark Morrow? But we weren't discussing the motion. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's just the fact that uh, we have mentioned what should be the, the, if someone had any, any other, you know, I don't mind uh, listening to. But of course, that's the, the final decision. And I think it is, um, like I said, you'll be able to get enough information from these bodies that I've just mentioned. So we'll move swiftly to to note this report, which outlines the current vaccination rates for Greenwich with comparisons with neighboring boroughs in southeast London. Um, can I invite Steve to, um, and then um, your, and David, Steve and David to actually. And the cabinet member as well. Can we start? Yes, yes. You, can, you can start, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much um, for having us, uh, Chair. Um, so, uh, as mentioned, uh, the report um, before you today will be focusing on current vaccination rates um, for Greenwich with comparisons uh, with our neighbouring brothers and the boroughs and South East London and ICB. Um, but before I hand over to officers who will be presenting the report, I think just one key thing I wanted to kind of uh, highlight was that 
ultimately we are providing a report on vaccinations, um, but um, local authorities are not directly responsible for commissioning um, uh, vaccinations. So that responsibility and the funding that goes with it sits with uh, NHS England. So just uh, for members to be mindful of that, but um, I will hand over to officers to uh, present the details of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lolivar. Um, so yes, very, very um, pleased to be able to talk to you about vaccination this evening. Um, I'm just going to set a little bit of context, sort of historical and global, um, just briefly, and then I'll hand over to David, who's the person in my team who leads on our contribution to um, uh, to health protection, which includes vaccination, although, as the Cabinet member has said, it's actually NHS England who are the responsible organisation for commissioning and securing vaccination programmes in line with a national schedule um, for um, different groups within the population, largely children, but some vulnerable groups and older, older adults. So just, just by way of, um, of background, uh, in, in public health we see vaccination as the second most important intervention for preventing avoidable poor health and early death after clean water. So it's an absolutely fundamental, critical tool in the public health toolbox that has um, absolutely revolutionized the way that, that, that medicine uh, looks after the populations. So if we look back um, 100 years, infectious diseases were um, still the biggest cause of uh, early death, avoidable <coughs> early death in the UK for our populations. In fact, if you look at um, children aged under one, so the infant mortality levels, um, we, we, uh, 100 years ago, we saw about 90 deaths to babies under one per 100,000 population. Now it's down to four, and immunization is the main cause of why those, um, those 86 deaths per 100,000 are no longer seen. So. Um, we, we have historically had diseases like polio, diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, measles, mumps, rubella, flu, pneumococcal infection, all of which are now amenable to, um, immu to, to immunization. Uh, and we, we routinely uh, offer immunization to our, to our populations in different age groups, according to the evidence base, to try to prevent those diseases. Um, many of them are very tiny in their, in their occurrence. Uh, some of them still do cause concern. So this year, for example, we have seen quite significant measles outbreaks in, in London. Um, uh, in, in some boroughs more than in others, in Greenwich, the, the number of cases has been towards the sort of middle, of, middle to the lower range. Um, uh, in Lambeth, for example, one of our um, South East London neighbours the, the numbers have been far, far higher. Uh, and those are to do with uh, the, the, the numbers of children who have not been given the full course of, of MMR vaccination. We've also seen uh, a, a high rate of pertussis, which is otherwise known as whooping cough, across the country this year. Um, there was a, a lot of noise in the press earlier on in the year calling it the 100 days cough. Uh, as if it was something new, but it, it, it is actually a, a disease that we've had um, for, uh, for a very, very long time, and it is vaccine preventable. Uh, sadly, there have been round about a dozen babies who died from whooping cough um, this year because the numbers have been so high, um, largely to, to mothers who had not taken up the offer of the, uh, of the pertussis vaccine. So just a little bit of, of kind of background and context and, and why we're, we're pleased to, to speak to you about immunizations, uh, recognizing that how, how critical it is to, to the health of, of our populations. Um, but there's, uh, there's, as David will describe, there's, there's still some headroom to go around keeping our rates as high as possible and supporting our, our, all of our communities. Thank you. Okay, Thank you, so, Steve. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I'll begin with um, what the ambition is in regard to where we would like to be, where we need to be in regard to uh, vaccination rates. So um, in regard to the rate where we ideally should be to be maximal, be maximal benefit, the World Health Organization has the target of 95% coverage for all childhood vaccinations. 
as the tables illustrate, and there's the comparisons across South East London, <coughs> including England as well, this is a, a problem both for Greenwich, for London, for the country. This is, an, this is a story that's across the country in regard to the vaccination rates for a number of different reasons. Um, I think it's been flagged, obviously, very recently. Uh, uh, Lord Darcy has talked about the NHS and the challenges they've had in ways what we're seeing in regard to the challenges of the NHS can also be seen in vaccinations. So looking at the rates we've got, we're not at 95%, but if you look at, for instance, I'll just highlight a few. MMR has been a challenge for many different reasons, including the misinformation that came from, from Andrew Wakefield back in the late 90s. We still see the ripple effects of that, those who missed their vaccination, and that's why we're seeing what we're seeing in regard to measles. So if you look at the table in regard to um, quarter four, um, Greenwich was at uh, 86, but and Bromley was uh, so uh, 86, Lamb was 83, Lewisham 84, etc. What you'll see through the table, and this is generally consistent for a number of reasons, Greenwich is often in the middle of the pack because the urban boroughs often have lower rates, and that's often to do with the transient population it's far it's difficult because the movement of population in urban boroughs like Lambeth and Southwark is creates even more challenges to do those the first vaccination the second etc so that's quite common it's also deprivation plays a part here so both for the urban boroughs and where we are Greenwich in comparison with Bromley and Bexley so that's a story that is the narrative throughout the thread that I've seen in the 21 years I've worked in Greenwich. So you, we usually are in the middle of the pack. We'd love to be at the top, as in like the best, but it's always a challenge for those different reasons. Um, in regard to um, DTAP, which is a kind of a combined vaccine, it's exactly the same sort of picture. So Greenwich is at 88, Bromley 91, Bexley 90, uh, Lambeth was at 89, so just, and Lewisham at 89. So it's kind of generally, um, um, fairly good in the current climate, but London, higher than London, because the average for London was 87, but England was at 92. So 90, England overall were doing better overall, but still no one is achieving 95. In regard to COVID and flu, now this is, obviously this is a very different, both COVID of course, who's offered COVID now is very different to when, of course, during the pandemic. So um, I'll just outline that briefly if that's useful to the, to the committee. So at the moment, for, for the COVID vaccination, and there's the autumn and winter programs, there's a spring booster, which is targeted, and of course, there's the winter, which is aligned with flu. So uh, the, for 24-25, residents in care homes for older people, all adults, this is COVID, of course, all adults aged 65 and over, um, and then uh, uh, persons aged six months to 64 years who have, are in the particular clinical risk groups. That could be, for instance, cancer, et cetera, a number of different things. Um, I will highlight flu while I'm there, of course. Well, let's just highlight, so this is what flu will be for this winter, and this will be kicking off shortly in October. So uh, if the flu vaccine is anyone age 65 or over, um, people have certain long-term health conditions, people are pregnant, live in a care home, or the main carer for an older or disabled person will receive a carer's allowance, and people who live with someone who's a weakened immune system. In addition to that, frontline health and social care workers can also get a flu vaccine through their employer. Now, moving on in regard to what is happening now, the previous government, the previous administration did kick off a brand new national vaccination strategy in December 2023, which outlined a number of different priority, pre priority areas, including how they would expand online services. And I think this is also now echoed through the Darcy report in regard to what's going to happen in regard to e services in the future and how the NHS needs to go from analog to digital. And I think we'll see probably far more movement in this area in the coming weeks and months. Um, so what their ambition from this strategy, and it is still in place, it may very well be reviewed like lots of strategies, but as it is at the moment, their, their ambition is many more people will be able to book their vaccines online through the NHS app. Uh, families will be able to also view their full vaccination record with clear information uh, about their vaccinations and how to keep well. That's going to be very, very important. They're complicated. Um, you might have noticed that we haven't put in the report the vaccination schedule. Um, the reason why there's a, there's a link to it, but we're all happy to circulate to the committee, is because they change an awful lot. They adjust often, they can change a few times a year, new vaccines come on board, and also the schedule changes. So um, we, so there's a very detailed, for instance, the early years, most of it's early years, and of course there's the, the older, there's the, for instance, there's a few later in the later years, but overall it's the early years, most of them, and then school-aged. 
Um, further, the, in regards to the strategy, the other things that are going to look at are vaccination delivery in convenient local places. We've targeted outreach to support uptake in underserved populations. So they're trying to make it as easy as possible for people to take up a vaccination offer with sites as GP practices, pharmacies, as well as shopping centres, supermarkets and community centres. This is, um, as I understand, this is built on a lot of the models that were implemented during COVID-19 pandemic, where you saw uh, vaccination off in different places and that learning has been built again. Um, they're looking, of course, at uh, bespoke outreach services. Services will be tailored to communities that are more under-vaccinated, so they build trust and confidence, of course, just like we saw during COVID-19 pandemic. In addition, a more joined-up prevention and vaccination office will be made available. So vaccinations and activities should be holistic, offering multiple um, vaccination for the whole family where appropriate, including COVID and flu alongside, for example, opportunities like MMR, HPV, etc. Doing all these things at the same time joined up makes it far more convenient and better for people. In, re in regard to that, locally, for the local ICB, they've aligned, the ICB have aligned the national strategy. The ICB has refreshed, refreshed its vaccination immunisation strategy and has embedded within the six boroughs an approach to increase uptake by developing trust and confidence in the child immunisation programme with local communities. In addition to that, there's a number of initiatives um, that, have, that have linked directly to the strategy that the, we will see locally in the coming weeks and months. So, um, so to improve the immunisations of Greenwich, they're looking at, um, well, some have actually kicked off very recently. So from the 1st of September, just a few weeks ago, a new community provider delivering the neonatal uh, BCG service uh, began, and that is a Hounslow and Richmond Community Healthcare. In addition to that, we now have a new school-aged uh, school immunisation provider, which is also Hounslow and Richmond Community Healthcare. They began work on the 1st of September, 2024. Um, in August 2024, Greenwich um, has a brand new immunisation coordinator. Really important work they will do to coordinate the system locally. So that would be because immunisations are delivered in different places. The bulk are in general practice, as those we know, but also, the, also in pharmacy and, of course, what happens in schools. So it's really important we have that coordination role to support all providers. So they've come in post. Um, GPs will have just recently been offered in August as well a new incentive scheme, so this came from the NHS, where they're providing incentive to roll out immunisation in community settings, so not just in their practice, so making it far more convenient and also targeting underserved populations. And finally, um, um, in September 24th, so now, uh, the ICB will be commissioning two pharmacies in the borough to offer child immunisations, including MMR, which I think is a, a great initiative because it means, of course, pharmacies are open at longer hours and people will be able to walk in and obtain those vaccinations. Thank you. Thank you, um, David, for your presentation, and um, Steve as well. Um, I will ask members if you have any question, you can direct it to um, both of them, please, and the cabinet lead. Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Morrow. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to officers and the Cabinet lead for what you're doing and for the, the work being done to improve vaccination rates and protect everyone. Um, vaccinations are, are safe and free and they work. Um, so it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I've got a, a couple of questions. Should I do all at once and then see who, yes. see who wants, to, yes. wants to chip in? Okay, um, one question is, is there an effect on vaccination uptake from people passing around incorrect information online, particularly thinking of Facebook, that sort of thing? Um, could you say something about what uh, a team working in the community to increase vaccinations is, is like rather than medical professionals? Um, is, that, is that a different approach? Um, also, could you say something about what the incentive is that's being offered to doctors? Um, will pharmacists be offered the same incentive? And finally, um, I understand the most common reason for children from, uh, I think it's five to nine, to be offered emergency treatment or admissions hospital is actually tooth extraction. Um, so I'm wondering if our community vaccination teams will be hanging around in A&Es looking for um, fed up parents with grumpy children so they can have a discussion about vaccinations while they're waiting 
um, for that to be done, or is that not the approach? Because, it, I mean, with a lot of healthcare, you, you, it is the approach that you, you turn up in A&E because you think you've got a heart flutter and then they talk to you about your weight and your mental health and your exercise and stuff. Could, could, could they be hanging around in, in A&E with a, a tray of vaccines? Thank you. So, um, there, is, there, is, there is, of course, evidence that, um, that misinformation does in, misinform people, and absolutely, and that's really important that we, we support our local communities so that they get the correct information. Um, the, what I outlined in the report, and, um, and what we also saw during COVID as well, is that, that although that will play a part, for some, and we need, to, we need to address it and work with our communities and our vulnerable communities who are often more vulnerable to these, these, this misinformation. Um, many of the things that we also find is actually how the system works and flexes to the convenience of the communities that we serve. And the NHS is a great deal of challenges, as we know at the moment. And I think overall the vaccination rate and the challenge of the vaccination rate, the biggest challenge are fundamentally of workforce, of the system, of the challenges of what we're seeing and the demand in, in general practice and the other the, 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 the other services. So I think, so as I outlined in the report, I think the, the challenge is really a, around demanding pressure within the primary care, overall real or perceived access issues. And we have seen that because those, the, the, you know, the really, uh, the pressure of general practice, there's some people who just, well, as are not going to contact them, they're perceived because they feel that this is not going to be possible, I won't get an appointment, as well as that is real, as well as perceived. It depends on where we are and the practice. So um, families are hesitant to access NHS services, that's, that's been seen, that's been identified for those reasons. Post-COVID, of course, what's happened, that's informed lots of things. Staffing and workforce pressures, without a doubt, are playing a part in all of these things and how we can deliver or that the NHS can deliver. And there is some hesitancy in information, but what we've done locally and, and our role as assurance is that we, we come together, both the NHS and, and uh, Greenwich, that we come together, for instance, and look at the engagement and comms teams and how we engage in local communities. So these are the regular meetings where we look at initiatives we, and then we look at the data and then we can look at where we need to target information, et cetera. So that hopefully adjusts, uh, um, um, looks at how we can look at misinformation and make sure the right information gets out to our communities. So it's kind of trying lots of different things, but it, there's a lot of challenges at the moment, as I've, just, as I've outlined. I hope that answers you that question. Okay. Of course. Okay, the incentive for GPs, of course, it's, it's, it, there's a financial incentive, and what they've offered to them is because of the things we've said, that the pressure, the, all the things I've said about general practice, is that then them support working with others, so that could be a community centre. That could be actually going out, taking a clink in the box to different places, and they're being incentivized to do that based on their data, on their list data. So that's really what that would generally look like. When that's happening, what would we would do, both in partnership with the NHS, is we'd support the uptake of that. We'd work with the GP practice. That could be a comms engagement process as well. So it's us all trying to have that role where we all come together to support our local communities, and then, of course, learn from it. At the moment, we know there's some initiatives in regards to the GP Federation, where they're testing out some different options and how that can work in area of low uptake. So it's, it's kind of like looking at different, all coming together as a partnership, whether it's the community, whether it's the NHS, our local authority, so that we can try and find solutions to these difficult situations. But there is, as I said, there's incentives directly to the GPs. In regard to pharmacy, um, that there's a new scheme that's been rolled out by NHS Pharmacy First, Vaccinations, of course, I said there's two new vaccines, two uh, options of new um, pharmacies going live in Greenwich that we offer child at IMS. But the Pharmacy First scheme with NHS England will be expanded over time. And it is very likely, as I understand, that that will obviously include the wider offer of immunisation and vaccinations. So I think I don't know the full details of where we are with that as that rolls out. But as these are literal pilots, they're looking at a number of different things in regard to pharmacy first, like a contraceptive pill, et cetera. But as I understand, that's part of the schedule in the future. I hope that answers your question. I'll, I'll have a go at the um, 
dental health uh, suggestion that you that you've made, Councillor Morrow. I think it's a it's a, an interesting suggestion, and I and I can see um, why why you why you make it. Um, you're absolutely right that kind of primary school age children, the 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 reason, the, the sort of highest reason for um, admission to acute hospitals is is dental health related and tooth extra complex tooth extractions for for young bodies. Um, I think quite a lot of those would be children who would be um, on the elective pathway, so they so they've been booked to have their extraction rather than being in A and E. And even though the number is the highest when you look at children of that age, we're still not talking about hugely high numbers. It's just we don't want children going into hospital for admissions of that age. For, for anything really and so the the numbers are generally very low for other things too um, so I don't think we would see um, sufficient numbers of children already grumpy as you say waiting in A&E for it to be um, a viable thing to do we are doing that with smoking I think we might have talked to the panel when we came last time that there are a lot of people waiting in A&E who are um, who are current smokers, and that we are actually, there's actually a very good evidence base around offering them some tobacco treatment whilst they're waiting for hours in, in also grumpy in A&E. In a &E. um, so we will, we will be doing that um, in Lewisham and Greenwich, um, in, in QE and Lewisham hospitals as a, as a pilot this coming year. That's not really relevant to immunizations, but um, uh, it's a similar sort of principle. I, will, uh, I know you have a last question, but I will open it to other members, and then I'll come back to you for your last question. Um, anybody? You, um, any question at all? Then I come back to you for your last question. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If I've understood right, the, probably the, the part of the puzzle that's being pushed on at the moment is making things easy and available and there it's not the not the bigger stuff about how there might be some people who've heard wrong messages or you know so if if that is the case how many how many children are there who reach school age um, without having had at least one or two appointments at a doctor's or seen a medical professional I, I would have thought almost none uh, many children would have had you know, five, 10, 20 appointments by that point. Um, so why haven't they been vaccinated? Thank you. Um, I, d I don't have those figures, but um, what, we do, what we do know, of course, and there's a number of different initiatives to how IT is going to be used in the future, and I'll come on to that in a moment, is that um, appointments are missed. And when we drill down on data, so for instance, if you look at lots of vaccinations, they have two doses, and people miss appointments, and then they don't have the next appointment, or appointments have been cancelled. So this is these things happen. Same with us when it's in schools, when we have um, um, in regard to the immunisation program going to school, sometimes those things that children are absent. So it's kind of like a follow-up. It's it's like it's like a, a race. They're constantly trying to chase after the kind of getting to a point because it's a moving target. And I think that's, real, that's, that's a real challenge, as well as all the things I've said about the, the, the wider system. So there is, um, through GPs, they use a system called EMIS, and our, 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 um, our health visiting service also now has, has EMIS, and the, we're looking at initiatives at the moment where they are going to be sharing data that means they'll be able to flag missed appointments more so through the system. So that means either the health visiting service can say this person has missed, this family's missed appointments, etc. So there kind of be like a more of a, uh, a digital triangulation of data. So we've got more eyes on the goal as it were to say, look, this family has missed these appointments. We're talking to them. We'll make sure we're flagging this to them. We're getting them booked in. So it's just, so that's gonna be a useful initiative as we, that's rolled out and they share data through the EMIS system. So that hopefully will help. As I outlined, which is going through the NHS app, what their ambitions are is that those who have the NHS app, I hope all of you do, because it's quite useful, um, is that that's going to adjust over time. So when you are a family and you have children, it will flag, it won't just 
wait for you to come go on it and look at your look at your, your health record it will flag just like you know your Facebook says like you've got a message so it will do more of that so it will know when you've missed appointments so using IT far better in the future that's I think that's a great initiative it should hopefully come online in this coming months but I, I don't know the full details NHS digital will have those but that's the ambition as I understand I hope that answers your question thank you is it fully answered now Okay with that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have just some one or two questions. I mean, the area of interest is actually when um, the statement was made: vaccination saves lives and protects people's health. It ranks second only to clean water as the most effective public health intervention to prevent diseases. Um, that is absolutely a truthful statement. But then we have a situation where some communities are under vaccinated um, in sex circumstances what i what are the strategies we have within our local authority here to cover those places and i think when it came to um, COVID, or when we when the pandemic pandemic came we had a problem of some people due to their cultural backgrounds or religious beliefs did not want to take at all so what strategies are put in place to more or less reach these people because I know of a situation where even medical doctors um, um, were, were, were among those who were very keen, not, not keen to take the, the vaccination until the law was liberal and then, uh, you know, they could, because people were asked to leave if they couldn't, if they didn't take the, the vaccination until the law was more or less reversed. So my question is the undercovered areas, how do you um, cover those places, what are the strategies you have in place, and what do you do with people with cultural and religious um, kind of restrictions that makes them not to um, take vaccinations? Thank you. Okay. Um, so this is um, a various pronged attack on this, and it's not just this exclusively what I'm going to outline. So I'll just give you an example of how we as a system are working differently. And, and, and Steve referred to it as around the kind of a neighbourhood approach that we're taking. So at the moment, they, uh, how we, as a partnership, that's obviously the local authority, the NHS, uh, provides us communities. We are, we're, we're testing new things out in the neighbourhood approach, going down to, to, going to uh, local neighbourhoods, working with communities, in different ways with GPs, with primary care providers, and we're kind of looking around locality. So personally, I currently have been involved in Horn Park. Um, there's work in Glyndon and Plumstead, etc. A number of different areas where we're testing out different ways of how we are building a working collaboratively with communities. So we start with communities and what their needs and understanding are, rather than top us top down. It should be really learning and listening and working with people. So we build things that make sense to them and that's an initiative that's happening in the borough in different places and it's building it's happening in Thames in partnership with Peabody etc and so what we will be doing and definitely what I've been doing in Horn Park is that as we're developing this immunization vaccinations is very very important initiative and as those who all know um, the challenges of the borough in different ways and borders um, probably 75 percent of people who live in Horn Park have a, a Lewisham GP, and that's where all the vaccinations are. So, so here's an example, and there's many, but I'll just do this one, um, is that how we are working with Lewisham, with Lewisham Federation, GP Federation, our own GPs, our own communities in Horn Park, is small steps, but we're, we have a group every week where we come together and we're looking at these different solutions and options. And if they have an, uh, the low uptake, which we do have a low uptake in different vaccinations for Horn Park, as we know, because the data they've shared with us, we will work collaboratively across borders to make sure that community, how we are going to make sure that for community, the uptake is increased. Now, this, it's a work in progress, but that sort of a process is the way we're going to work. Work. It's so important. We shouldn't be top down. We should be really be in the heart of these communities, taking this neighbourhood approach to make sure that we're listening to communities, learning what they need, what they understand, and their priorities. When you do a rural partnership with communities, it makes all the difference. And I think that sort of work and building on that and vaccinations, me myself having a lead role for the Borough of Health Protection, and I'm part of those discussions, I will absolutely ensure that vaccinations are in those conversations and they will be 
discussed and looking at data collaboratively how we can achieve things better. But working with primary care communities, all of the partners is going to make the difference. So um, we will get to there. We will do our best. Um, thanks for your answers. Um, there's a question, yes. Councillor May. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a vested interest because I'm councillor for Middle Park and Horn Park, and I didn't know that, that this was going on. So how are you um, contacting the communities? There's, um, this, 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 and I know uh, councillor May in regards to you know the source very well, and uh, I'll happily update you about that uh, <laughs> separately. But um, the... Um, We've set up, there's a Horn Park group, it's small, but we've linked, that is led uh, working in partnership with primary care, public health. There's a group, there's a resident group. I know you've been, I think you've been involved in some of those. They sit at the moment, but there's also the partnership of providers all coming together. So I, at the moment, chair a meeting, which is including... It's included primary care, Lewisham, it's included, um, of course, Oxleys, et cetera, who come together to look at what we are going to be doing in partnership because we also need to, as provide providers and us as the local authority, we need to make sure that we are working collaboratively, not in our silos. So, and that's incredibly important. Otherwise, what is the offer? What are we going to be doing with communities? So that's the work we've been doing in Horn Park. Um, some very good news around to Horn Park through this work. They've just applied and been successful to establish a residence association. So, um, so that's kind of the step-by-step -step work. And establishing that, that means that we'll be able to grow this and things will uh, hopefully flourish in the near future. You've got good news for your award, isn't it? Thank you. Um, is there another further question from, oh, there's a question from Francis, yes. Francis, come across, uh, across and then ask your question. Um, I, as I understand, the fall of the immunization has been dropping off uh, since the 90s. Well, I would like to suggest that we haven't got an integrated care. Before, there was a baby clinic at the GPs, health visitors were there, the mothers were there, or the carer who looked after the child, and so therefore the mother was seen regularly, so is the child, therefore they were well known, and also their um, goals, in, um, goals in achievements of how they should be progressing in the early years. And therefore, there was a good build-up of a relationship within the health visitors and the practice, and, the, and also it was also preventive, um, preventive medicine, public health medicine. And that has been gone. It's just an example of how we had an integrated care, and now we have got a very much fragmented, if you look at all the parts to it. And I think if we look back at the data, and correlate it with the changes. I think it'd be very useful for the committee to see what, what caused the changes, because there's always cause. And uh, I, that I think it would be very helpful for the public as well to know why, why, why things have happened. If you don't know why, you can't really get to the beginning of it, or to the end of it. Thank you. Thank you, um, Francis, for your question and or your comment. I think any of you would like to comment on that, if that is okay? Um, I think, I think to to an extent, actually, I think what kind of David was talking about is is there's a recognition of that neighbourhood and community approach. Um, I think, as pointed out earlier in the Darcy report, I, I think a lot of what we're talking about now is is years, in, this, in my opinion, years of underinvestment years of underinvestment in capital, in structure, in digital. Um, and, and there is a fragmented system that is, and the staff are working incredibly hard to make it work. Um, but that example there of the data that David was pointing out about the struggle of having to do data sharing between what are ultimately private practices in general practice, then across two different uh, council boundaries, it's a really difficult system to work, and I think that example shows that, you know, there are there are people like David and the team that are, uh, I guess, 
having to put like safety nets around that to try and see where there are people sipping through the gaps. So I, I think it is, is, there's a big national issue here, um, obviously one that we can't alone fix, but I think has been recognised that there are issues. And then I think there is a collective agreement that a neighbourhood approach, uh, a preventative approach, uh, out of hospital into the community is the way that we all want to work. Um, and I think it is a matter of, I think there is a, a recognition of that at a government level as well, which is positive. Um, and I think it's now about, uh, I think we've been doing it on a, on a certain level, but I hope with that, that national recognition that it might be a, a kind of a new way of working where we aren't trying to kind of like triangulate all the data and whatnot. There should be, to kind of Matt's point, how is one person, oh, sorry, Councillor Morris' point, um, how is a, a child kind of getting to school age and not having been immunised? And, that, and that there is a, there's a good challenge there, like in a sense it shouldn't happen. Uh, we, that, that child should have been reached and shouldn't have slipped through those gaps. But I think sadly there, is, there are complexities in the system that everyone is working very, try, very hard to try and work around. Um, but yes, I think there's a shared desire to be working more within our communities. Thank you, um, Councillor Lalva, for that um, statement as well. Um, I think, um, Frank, you're absolutely right. Um, things in the past, and that's why the report indicated, you know, many years ago, we, uh, England was possibly among the best vaccinated country in, the, in Europe. Um, but it is not the same story today. And of course, it's important to recognize where the problem is coming from and tackle it. And I think the report did speak about how locally they are, they are looking at those areas as well. So yes, your point is well taken, and I think you are taking note of that as well. Um, if there's no further question, I will say thank you for um, David and Steve for your fantastic presentation. Um, David is the Associated Director for Integrated Commissioning and Health Protection, and Steve is Director for Public Health. And then we have the Cabinet Lead also for Health um, in the person of Mariam Lolliver. So thank you all for your um, statement and presentations. Thank you. The report is for us to note. So I will now move to the next item, which is item six, Adult Social Care Quality Commission CQC where CQC means Care Quality Commission Assurance Preparation. And we have the director for also adult social care in the person of um, Nick Davids and also the cabinet lead um, this evening. So over to you. Um, yeah, I'm still here. Sorry, I haven't left. Um, I'll just do a quick intro and then hand over, uh, I think, to Nick. Uh, so I think one of a few key things to point out uh, adult social care, which is a significant part of council's um, work and, and, and budget, um, is providing that care for, for individuals that need it. Um, adult social care hasn't had an inspection regime for over, I believe, a decade now. So this is a new inspection regime which is coming in. Um, and I think that, you know, it, that is important, but I think it's also worth, I guess, acknowledging there's a significant undertaking that I think the teams will have, were doing in preparation for it. Um, and I guess also worth noting that this is still, I guess, a pilot approach um, that the government has uh, kind of rolled out, or previous government has initially rolled out. Um, and as you would have seen recently, there were, with the DASH review, did highlight concerns about the, the, the CQC in general, uh, and, uh, and there are those kind of uh, about um, f how fit for purpose. So I feel like it is a, uh, a, an interesting time, um, um, but I know how hard the teams are working to prepare, um, and I think we uh, see it, I guess, as an opportunity to uh, uh, have kind of like mirror held up to us in a good way, but also show good practice. Uh, but I think Nick will is very busy on this, so he will be able to provide you a bit of a sense of, I guess, that prepare, preparation that is underway in the department. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, um, Mariam. Um, Nick, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> yes, in, so in terms of um, CQC assurance, I've provided the report there. I, I suppose I wanted to make a few points. 
um, and then really happy to answer any questions that um, the panel may have. Um, firstly, it's to say that um, regardless of CQC, we are committed to quality assurance of our offer, of our adult social care offer. So despite the fact that CQC haven't been regulated, haven't been in to see us, we've had um, sort of peer review uh, opportunities over the years um, and we've very much taken a serious approach to our quality assurance of our, our services. We've also focused on how to continuously improve our services and focus on resident outcomes and, and really to focus on the strength of our residents um, and what they're able to do and achieve and achieve in terms of independence. So I think it's it's really important to, to acknowledge that first and foremost. So in CQC coming in, uh, absolutely it, it, um, it, it provides us with, um, as Councillor Lollivara said, a, uh, an opportunity both to highlight the areas where we think we're really strong, um, but also to highlight the areas where we know we've got work to improve, um, but to reassure ourselves that we've got plans around those, those areas. So I, th I think the key, the key element in all of this as well is the, the, the focus on outcomes for residents and making sure that we're co-producing those outcomes for our residents, which is work that we're really committed to in the doctorate and in adult social care. Um, because in CQC triangulating the information we provide, when we provide our self-assessment, which will state where our strengths and where our areas for improvement are, they will triangulate that with the lived experience of residents, um, with casework, um, and they'll speak to people, they'll speak to staff, they won't necessarily be interested in speaking to me and what I've got to say about the service. They'll test that with frontline workers and they'll test that with residents and they'll triangulate that information in order to come to their conclusions. So I think that's, that's all really important. I think there are risks and I've outlined some of those in the, in the paper. Um, you know, the, the funding of social care and the lack of sustainable funding for social care um, sees us year on year um, struggling to balance our budgets um, and to meet the demand, which is ever increasing and has increased, um, certainly post COVID, um, in terms of safeguarding, in terms of presentations at our front doors, be that the hospital, be that our community front door. And also the workforce as well, um, where we've got a really brilliant and committed workforce um, in uh, adult social care in Greenwich. A lot of residents work for us um, and there's a lot of diversity in that workforce and they're part of our community. Um, but it's been increasingly hard to sustain some of that workforce and also to offer opportunities for career development. So all of those things I think are risks, the financial risks, the risks around demand, which I do think need to be articulated and I've laid out in the paper. Um, but in terms of the, the background to um, CQC uh, and their assurance process, um, it came into effect um, in January 2024. Um, in terms of the um, Health and Care Act 2022, that introduced the, the CQC assurance process. Uh, along with a range of other reforms which were effect effectively uh, you know which were effectively deferred and delayed uh, um, and will now not be implemented and those related to funding and the sustainable funding of social care so we're yet to see what's going to emerge from the new government in that regard however the assurance piece has still remained and, and the first inspections under the new regime started in January 2024 um, what the CQC are looking at is four areas really. So one is how we work with our people and that's really about how we do our engagement and our assessment of people's needs and what we provide and how we support people. Providing support that domain which relates to how we commission our services largely. So that is, is, is where our commissioning approach is and how we do those is, is looked at. Ensuring safety, uh, our safeguarding arrangements and um, 
Councillor Lolivar and the independent chair of, um, of our Safeguarding Adult Board presented at Cabinet uh, yesterday the annual Safeguarding Adult Report, which I'd recommend to you because it really is um, very accessible and a good read about some of the issues and some of the really good and innovative work we're doing in Greenwich, particularly around self-neglect and hoarding, which I think is one of our strengths, and that's something we'll certainly pull out in our um, self-assessment. But those, those safeguarding arrangements are, are key. And then our leadership and governance, so how do we lead, how do we govern um, and ensure that we've got assurance across the piece. So those are the domains, and there's lots of detail underneath those domains that's published and certainly is accessible to the panel. I think another thing to note is that there were some pilots, uh, some pilot sites to test this approach um, back in uh, 2023. Those pilots reported back, they were, there were no pilot sites in London, um, but the pilot sites were Birmingham, Lincolnshire, North Lincolnshire, Nottingham and Suffolk. All who were rated good, other than Nottingham, who requires improvement. But it's very much a case that the CQC were learning and trying to work through a development of that framework. What's been really helpful is that those sites, those pilot sites, have shared their experience with us as, as um, authorities and us as colleagues. So we've learned from them um, and we've learned. Um, uh, a, a lot about the process and what um, the CQC are focused on. Since um, January, 43 authorities have been in the process of assurance of those 13 have been in London and they've conformed with the ICB um, sub-regional configuration. So the CQC have, have, have assured clusters of boroughs who have, have been in North Central and North West London. So they've not yet uh, sought to assure anyone outside of those two sub-regions. Um, and of those, we've only had three ratings through Hounslow, who were rated good. Then more recently, Brent as requires improvement and Harrow as requires improvement. So that gives a bit of a picture. Um, the intention is from the CQC to complete all assessments within two years from January. Um, I'm not sure if they'll achieve that given the current pace and also, as uh, Councillor Lavar mentioned, the um, DASH report and its conclusions and whether or not that changes the approach. Um, but all that said, um, we're ready um, for uh, the uh, potential that CQC could contact us at any time. I've laid out in the, the pack the process, it's unlike Ofsted, so they don't immediately land. It's, it's essentially some, a lot of activity for us to provide data and information and the self-assessment in the first three weeks. And then within a couple of months, they arrive and then they, they, they visit and site visit and inspect. So <clears throat> different to Ofsted um, and, um, uh, and obviously an emerging um, a, a framework. I think I just wanted to pull out a, a few things. Um, one, one is that um, what we're really pleased to be able to talk about and our staff are able to talk about is our health and adult services vision, which has run over the last four years, and our forward thinking change program, which has been part of that. So what we've done um, that we're really proud of and we want to bring out is that when it comes to people waiting for services and our waiting lists, um, despite significant pressure, we're managing those well and we're managing those in a risk-enabled way. And I've included some information about how we manage our waiting lists and make sure that no one's, no one's um, left at risk. Um, we've improved our carer's offer through our carer's strategy. Um, and I know Councillor Lolivar um, has been really committed to the carer's partnership board um, and taking forward the actions from that strategy. And we've seen in our performance information more carers assessments being undertaken over the last year because of that focus, which is really positive. And we've invested in some additional carers support in the, in the community, um, which I think is really positive. Um, we've also uh, delivered change across our reablement services, which have been um, improved over the last couple of years with a real focus on the outcomes that we get for independence and we put a lot more therapy into that service so that people's um, independence can be regained. And then 
we've modernised our learning disability services, and I think there have been some real highlights there in terms of the Sherrard Road Day Services, which has been transformed through uh, a community initiative called Heart and Soul and all sorts. And if you haven't been down to Sherrard Road recently, I would encourage you to do so because it's, it's a transformed service. It's vibrant. It's been modernised. Uh, and it's there um, co-produced by the residents that are, that are taking part in the activities there. And then more recently, Royal Hill um, and the Royal Hill development um, which has been a few years in, in the coming, but um, was really heartwarming to look at as a partnership across DRES, Health and Adults, uh, to deliver nine supported accommodation um, homes for our residents who've got learning disabilities, but who are able to be independent and live full lives. And again, I'd really commend you to, to look at the uh, Royal Hill development because Despite the challenges, um, we've been able to achieve real change in innovation. Um, that doesn't mean that we're complacent, though, and we know that um, we need to continue to work on um, making sure we're evidencing the impact of our outcomes on our residents and, and hearing back from them, that we're, we're also auditing our social work practice um, and put, doing that on a thematic basis so that we're getting that feedback loop right. Um, uh, so, and so those, those, I think, are some of the areas that we've pulled out in our self-assessment or our draft self-assessment. One of the challenges with not knowing when CQC are going to arrive is we need to make sure that when we prepare for this, we know that we could get a call tomorrow. Equally, we could get a call in 18 months' time. And so we want to make sure that we deploy our efforts and our workforce's efforts in the right way. Hence, we haven't written a self-assessment statement that we could share at this point because it may change in six months time but what we have kept a log of is all of the evidence that i've shared with you there and in the pack you'll see that we're constantly refreshing the evidence that we've got about what we've achieved in terms of outcomes but also key performance indicators as well so those are i think some of the um the, the key the key points um really happy to uh, take any questions um, and um, yeah and, and and really happy to provide any further updates to the to the panel as required so thank you thank you Nick for <coughs> your presentation um, the floor is open for anybody to ask a question and please do ask the questions because um, there are so many things that you know we need to know more so Feel free to ask those questions. Any? Oh, yes, there's a question on the floor. You can. Thank you, Councillor. And um, my name is Omar Aksoy, and I, I'm a uh, parent carer for my son who has DMD. And I would like to raise the issue of you know, the standard of care and the integrated systems in regards to the health and social care, plus the education for the DMD children and the young adults in DMDs. So um, one of the, this issue comes um, uh, to, to the to, you know, like, uh, um, discussion uh, because we have an international um, conference about uh, this condition and uh, this uh, the, you know, the lack of standard of care and the lack of integrated systems comes over and over again every year. So every year, as I say, in London there is this conference. You know, there are parents and the children that also come from like, you know, many countries around the world for instance, one family was like, um, you know, from Denmark. So, you know, they gave an example of how this is possible, right? Within the, you know, the government's, um, the, the state's resources and the, the, the human care, if you like, in the uh, healthcare uh, systems and the education and all that is that 
the, the child is in the center of everything. So they do not have to repeat to, you know, their needs wherever they go, be it in the uh, healthcare institution or education or the social care whatsoever. So wherever you go, everyone knows up to date where the child is, right? So, so you, you just have to tell what is the new dem uh, you know, needs of the child because this um, you know, condition is a progressive one. It's a complex, the, the children, the young adults have complex needs and it's constantly changing those needs. So I am you know, not speaking of myself. If you want, I can tell my own experience, which I did have to repeat so many times our own family story over and over again. It's a torturous thing for a parent to do, right? So, so what, what, what is your answers to this, this issue? I mean, it's affecting so many you know, families, I feel like, you know, just by pure chance, lucky as a family living in London, which is close proximity to the, you know, to, to hospitals and things like that. But there are families, they have to travel hundreds of miles, right, to this city to reach, to, you know, to, to find them even small answers to their issues and the problems. So, so what are you know, the strategies, if, if you like, I mean, the, um, so, so as a social care uh, director and the cabinet member or? Yeah, the, okay, uh, Th thanks. Everyone, so. thanks for the question. What yeah. did you say was your name, sorry? Omer Aksoy. Yeah. Romel. Omer, yeah. Omer, okay. Omer, yeah. Omer, thank you for your for your sharing your information and also putting a question across. You're not speaking about yourself, but you're speaking on behalf of so many parents out there. So, um, um, Nick Davis, if you have any comment to make on um, the question thank, that you put across. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I, I think... Um, What's been raised are really important themes around um, how we share information across um, health and social care. And we know there's more that we can do in that space because, um, you know, systems don't speak to each other at times. We've got computer systems, some of our interoperability. We have got things like the London Care Record and other initiatives which should ease that. But we do want to get into a space where people are only telling their story once uh, and that other professionals are able to build off that so that people aren't telling their story multiple times. So I think you raise an important point there. I think in terms of um, parent carers and carers in general, they're a big feature for us in Greenwich as being uh, us needing to support carers um, and do that in the best way we can. And I've pointed to our sort of carer's strategy in that context. Um, I think the other thing is that through transitions, especially if you've got um, a, a child, you know, who is going to become an adult and how you then work within children's services and then that transition to adulthood is a really important part. We know we've done a lot of work in Greenwich and we're proud of our transitions uh, approach in Greenwich because we've got a new preparing for adulthood team, which is multidisciplinary across adults and children to try and ease that transition because we know how difficult and stressful that can be for young people, but also for parents. So we're doing a lot of work in that space. When it comes to your own story, I'd be really happy to have a discussion with you, you know, outside of the meeting, just to check in and see, you know, if there's anything that 
else that we can support with or anything else we can learn from your lived experience. I suppose those points were more general points in the spirit of you raising the general points about um, having to support and manage complex health needs um, within a system where there isn't always join up and interoperability. So I don't know if that helps in any way, but that would be my initial response. Thanks. Thank you for that. I think um, uh, earlier on we did mention that um, if you could also contact your local councillor and put this thing across, he will be able to take up those concerns to the appropriate offices. I brought my uh, work councillor yeah. Thing you were going to speak to? Um, I, I've spoken to Mr. Axoy, have I said Axoy, um, uh, just before the meeting. So I've got his details down and I said I would specifically pick up the points he'd raised me, but you've just raised a few other really interesting points as well. So I will take that up as casework for sure. Thank you. Um, do we have any further questions to Nick? Um, Nick? A fantastic work you've done. Um, I have some two, two questions. Um, one is about, I, I think we've already heard um, from a gentleman who just spoke about sharing, um, <clears throat> especially the experience of another country. And you've just mentioned some pilot projects have taken place. Is it a case where those who have performed better, do, do, do you, do you, how do you get your information to make sure that you are not possibly doing something that will possibly not help us, and then possibly something that will be able to help us. us of course, those have, let's say, the places that they got good report, for instance. They might have been doing something good, that's why they got that report. So how you, you make that contact is something I wanted, if you could comment on that. And then you also mentioned something very, very dear to my heart. I championed disability in the local authority here. And last year, I had over nearly 10 families who contacted me about transition. When people are within the, moving from the, the ages from one to, um, or zero to, to 17, from 17 going to 18, um, especially children with disability, there was a problem of, um, the, 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 the children saying, the children team saying that it is their, it is, they, they have finished their responsibility and the adult team not taking over. And that gap was not just one family. I've experienced it myself because I've got a, a child that I care for as well. And he was in that category and I can confidently say it was a whole one year where he was left behind just because of the fact that the children's side were seen is the adult and then I know you said some work has been done about it but if you can also comment on what has happened so that such families including our, our, our participant this evening will not go through what um, we've heard this evening. Thank you. Thank you Chair. Yeah, really important questions. I think in terms of the learning where constantly learning and, and um, learning from, yes, the sites that have had assurance, but also lots of networks that we're involved in where we're looking at good practice and what areas are doing to develop good practice. So um, be that in London or be that nationally. One of the things that we are doing um, is in October 15th to the 17th, we've got an LGA peer review of our adult social care services. And so that's in preparation for CQC, but I think it'll actually be broader because on the panel, on, on the, the team, will be direct, a director of adult social care from another area, a principal social worker from another area, um, commissioning colleagues from another area, and um, a political uh, leader from another area as well. So we'll get a different perspective, and that I think has always got to be welcomed because we know we're always on a journey of learning in terms of improvements. So we're always open to that. 
What I would also say, though, is that we've got a lot to be proud of that we're delivering, where I think we are um, able to share that learning with others as well. So um, our work around um, personalization, which is um, through something called Think, uh, Think Local, Act Personal, talking about our direct payment offers and our ability for people to self-direct their support and choose that support is actually being featured at the um, the adult and children's conference in the autumn as a good practice example. And the work that we're doing on assistive technology enabled care, which will launch in the new year, is I think an exemplar of bringing together health and social care resources uh, in something that hasn't been seen in that way before. So I think absolutely we need to learn from others, but we also need to be proud and celebrate where we're de delivering um, really good uh, uh, cutting edge stuff ourselves. Um, so important points you raised about transitions and sorry to hear, always sorry to hear if uh, families have experienced those challenges. We know that it is a challenging area because of the different um, eligibility criteria and the different legislation in respect of children and adults. What we're really committed to doing is planning at the earliest opportunity for that transition with um, young people and with their families. Um, and we know, you know, if someone's got uh, particularly severe uh, health conditions, social care conditions, then they're going to need ongoing support, but that might need to change. So the earlier we plan, the better, and we're on that journey so that we make sure we do that. But we have established in Greenwich between adults and children's, what's called a preparing for adulthood team. So we've put some of our transitions workers from adults into the children with disabilities team to have a function which is more joined up and where we focused on the practice. So we focused on what's the experience of the young person and their family. And we know there's more we can do to, to um, improve upon that. So I'm not saying we've got that absolutely right, but I think um, the experiences you've talked about, I think, you know, will be less, uh, less felt because we've got that joined up an integrated team across adults and children's. Um, but that, that there remains a challenge at the, the point of resource allocation um, because the resources that are available in children's and uh, are required in children's are constrained as are they in adults. Um, so the more we can do um, work together with families about the future planning, the better because I think we'd all say, if we've got people who have got um, lifelong conditions, um, then we're all, always going to need to support people, and we need to support them in the most independent way possible. And if you were to take the amount of funding that we would spend over the lifetime of someone's support with us, and you were to put the choice in the hands of the family and the young person at the earliest opportunity, they would make probably better choices at that point than we might with our commission services. So we do need to move in that direction, and that's the direction we're moving into. I wouldn't say and sit here and say we've got everything so, sorted or everything right, but we're on that journey. Thank you, Nick. And finally, I think still addressing the gentleman's um, um, experience, and I know it's also common because I've had a lot of families also speaking about the same thing is, most parents or most carers are people that know much about their, 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 their children or call it even adults for that matter, whoever they are caring for. But then the continuous looking after these people, they need some kind of respite at some point. I think he did mention about that, that even getting a respite because if this person breaks down, then the cost of what will happen is even more than anything you can think about. So I just wanted you to comment on, um, you know, respite for carers, what you have in the local authority here, because that's also another area that I get people, you know, contact me about very, very often. Thank you. Yeah, ab absolutely. I think um, the, the carers respite for um, parents with children who require that respite I'd probably needs to come back to you with what that offer is from a sort of children's services perspective, because that's where that would be offered. What we're 
keen to do is join up our carers' strategy across adults and children, so it speaks to both. Because in, in, ad, in the carers' strategy that we have for adults, which is integrated with health, we have got the opportunities for you know, carers who, have, who are supporting adults to, to access some respite, but also to access a carers' assessment, which should be available to, um, colleague, uh, to, to, to residents who are caring for people, so that, um, that, that we, we put the support that is possible into place to support those caring arrangements, because we understand that those are uh, really hard commitments to uh, sustain, and so where we can help, we absolutely will within the resources that we've got available. Thank you. Want to ask your last question? Go, go for it. I mean, okay. all, all I would say, it's, it's difficult to comment on individual, individual circumstances, business, yes. but I'm very happy, as I know Councillor Oliver is, to, to take the individual casework up outside yeah. of the meeting. Uh, and just to reassure you on that, I, I know of um, a family where uh, when the person turned 18 and they did the assessment, of course it depends on the individual and the assessment. The person was given 20 days within a year. Um, 20 days means that you could book for the respite. So definitely, if your case is taken up, they will look at it, it's individual basis, and then they should be able to get um, the number of days that um, you know, the child or the carer can get for respite. Thank you. Uh, my name's Paul Richardson. Uh, my question really was on the minister last meeting, which unfortunately I, I missed because I was on holiday, uh, and I see that there was a, an, an item on MSK. Um, unfortunately, in, in the uh, minutes of the meeting, it's, it's rather brief, and uh, the director uh, of adult social care um, gave a brief update on how things, how things were going. And in the actual agenda, which I went back to for the 11th of July, it's a sort of blank page. And obviously, over the years, I've, a lot of us, in fact, and I think there's colleagues here who, who, who were involved in it as well, have looked at, um, at MSK because two things. It's one of the biggest privatisation areas within our NHS um, uh, sort of, uh, offers in, in and it's a monopoly basically uh, and also it's it's great importance and I'm assuming that's why adult social care are, 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 are very involved in it because it is the biggest area for morbidity um, in Greenwich is involving MSK so therefore uh, the group circle have had it for five years and I think they had two extensions so it's about seven years now uh, to next April this is a very very important thing and I was th I thought that there might be um, a list of the runners and riders so, so to speak in this uh, in this uh, competition for uh, running the MSK and I thought there might be uh, some data involved uh, showing how for instance circle had, uh, had improved things um, in terms of their the numbers, in terms of the outcomes and things like that. But I'm always quite disappointed to find out that there's very little of this. And it's not very trans... The, the other question I'd like to say is, that where's the transparency on this? Because what happens is that um, 
there's a whole thing about commercial confidentiality, and I'm assuming that's the area we're in at the moment. So we'll find out when we find out for the 1st of April. But I am concerned, uh, Circle, with its multiple owners over the years, um, and who else is involved in it as well. So that, I would want to see that probably, and I, I thought I'd bring it up now because you're looking at the date of meetings, new draft meetings, and there's integrated commissioning coming up. Whether that's part of that, I don't know. But I would have thought that MSK is well worth revisiting fairly shortly because a decision will be made for the 1st of April. I don't, know whether, I don't know whether that was a question or a point. I don't know. No, I think it's a statement. Everything. It's a statement because um, one thing that is clear is it's not on the agenda, and I do appreciate that it was discussed the last time. The last time here yeah, on the ministry, you've just seen it there, isn't it? We did um, have a good debate on MSK the last time, but of course the information you want, is, it has not appeared there. We can um, more or less... We, we know who to contact for you to get the information that you are speaking of. We, we will make sure we can pursue that. Yes, um, Councillor Williams. Chair, it might just be an error, but the presentation wasn't available on the day. It was circulated afterwards. But I would think that presentation should form part of the pack that was published. So was it added to the pack that was published post the meeting? Or did just the meeting pack go? Because we were provided with it after the meeting. But it is, I would think that wasn't a restricted document. So it should have gone into the pack as well as part of it. So I'm not sure if it's on the website or not. The minutes there. And then the discussion, all the meetings should be recorded. So you'd be able to watch the discussion even if you weren't there. Okay. Is the other point. And rather than rely on the minutes. Yeah. So. Now, Councillor Williams addressed it really. I, I, I'd spoken to the speaker just beforehand and said that there was a presentation. It should have gone out. I'm sure through uh, Raymond and colleagues we can get that circulated and up on the website because it was, wasn't available to be published at the time. So thanks for bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. I attended one of the um, consultation on uh, procurement for the MSK, uh, must have been last year, late last year, and I asked for data and it wasn't available. And um, one or two of the, the people present had had uh, care in either in a, um, QE or Blackheath Hospital. And of course, Blackheath Hospital is a private sector, which MSK is part of that organisation. And I've met several people since, and it appears, that's why data is important, that anyone that has the orthopaedics done in the QE, then they get a piece of paper about physio. Anyone that has the Blackheath care has three, four, five, six, seven, eight days. Therefore, there's inequality to start with. And if you don't have proper physio on anything after post-op, what you should have, then that's why you get disabilities. But also, has anyone looked at the costing between Blackheath and the QE? I know Lucian runs differently than orthopaedics because they've got their own staff in the, in the community. And so therefore, I think looking at the data is extremely important. And many people have said they've got something wrong with the ankle or whatever. And they say, can you send, um, can you send me a photograph? Now, my spinal consultant sent me for physio at St. Thomas's. The first visit was a phone call. And he told me if you put my neck to the left and my neck to the right, this is the sort of treatment should really be looked at. And I just burst out laughing. You know, I said, but you can't see me. <laughs> so this is what's going on. And that's from me, my personally. Thank you very much. Um, the, the only thing, and obviously it's up to the chair and the board to decide, but 
Um, my, I understand that with the previous presentation, you perhaps, you know, didn't have the like, depth of data that potentially yeah. you could request, as in if that's something that you wanted to in the future. Um, I think, you know, as mentioned, and I would agree, MSK is a really important contract. And I remember being on the scrutiny panel, I think, in the past uh, when it was discussed previously. So I think the panel would, if minded, could obviously ask for a more detailed kind of report ahead of the recommissioning if they so wished. Yeah, that is noted. Um, more detailed information about it. Yes, um, Councillor Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. And it's a useful segue, actually, if we're on to the next section, because in terms of the work programme, from the minutes previously, I know we were just agreeing the accuracy, but there was a discussion about adding and removing some items from the work yes. programme. So as a segue to Council Advice, I wondered if there was an update because we were told that would have to be cleared with the Chair of ONS and the Chief Executive. Yeah, to yeah that's is, right. Is there an update on those items? Yes, there's, 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 there's an update. What we succeeded in doing was, what was to be removed is what, one of them that we just discussed this, uh, this evening, the vaccination which was, we felt was really very, very important. But all the added items have been inculcated for the next program. So we've got, we've got all what was, um, was suggested um, um, on the last meeting. We've gotten it into the program, the work program. The desire of the panel to have it in this year's work program was the idea to drop some items that the panel didn't see. The feedback was there wasn't as much value in those items, perhaps as the items being proposed. I didn't get you, sorry. Sorry, so I think when we were in the room discussing it yes. last time, we suggested that some of those items didn't have the same value as the other ones proposed. Of course, yeah. And that would be a better use of the panel's time. But, so essentially you're saying it would just go in the new work program next year, now. Yeah, yeah, so, so what we did was, that's what I was just explaining. Um, the new items that were added was taken into consideration. We did, um, we had to go back to the chief executive and scrutiny chair for that, and I think um, that had taken place, isn't it? Could you just um, make a comment on that, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Williams, so the items that were suggested at the last meeting are not going to the next year's work program, uh, in the current year's work program. What the chair was trying to explain um, was that some of the items which were suggested to be removed were kept, for example, tonight's vaccination um, update. However, all the suggested items, um, to be specific, mental health services, um, the cancer screening, and maternal mortality have all been incorporated in this year's work program. They're not going to next year's. Everything has been captured. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's if at the back at of the. Back um, of your, oh, you don't have your. Program, your uh, yes. That's right. Yes. It's all. In, so in the they're case. all in there. Yeah, so everything has been captured, but we did, we did maintain some of the items of interest which the panel had previously suggested to be removed since we thought they were um, equally essential, but nothing has been and left we've, out we've in got terms of the clearance also from the chief executive that it's all right to, to go ahead with that. So that's excellent. One thing, that there were two other ones on there. You ran through the list, but what's not there, I think, is the financial one from Councillor Morrow and the prevention one in particular to live well from myself. On there. I think the prevention has been captured. It's, it's captured. Including cancer screening. Okay, so will that, just to be clear, as we're discussing the work programme, will that include, can we invite Live Well to that? Which one was that? The March. prevent. Prevention. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, absolutely. And, and also, in terms of the financial point, uh, the financial point that Councillor Morrow made, I think we're seeing that that's something that we'd need to pick up through... The rain, you know, through, through the reports, because it's through the individual reports, <coughs> including the mental health services update, because it's not something that we can necessarily bring back as a standalone item, if that makes sense. We felt like your because your questions, Councillor Morrow, were about um, delineating between what is prevention and what is um, what what is funded to to, to deliver. Care was my was my understanding of that, and we felt that if we addressed that through each of the reports individually, that may be the best way to to approach that one. Yeah, did you want to comment on that? Go ahead, Councillor Morrow. Thank you, Chair. Grateful for for that. Although I am 
perhaps just as confused now after hearing this discussion as I was at the beginning. What I can't see on this work program anywhere is the point where the people who make the decisions about what health services get funded in our borough will sit in front of us and explain their rationale for the choices they've made. And sorry, may, may I just add that the fact that um, the fact that I, ne I need to say that says a lot about the way health services are provided. Um, that that's not a standing item, and that it's not the top of the agenda every year for the health scrutiny panel, um, says a lot about the relationship between the democratic parts of the state and the, the service providers who do their own thing, um, irrespective of what um, the public say. Yeah, I, th I think, um, and uh, thank you, Councillor Moore. I, I think, in terms of the, um, the, 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 certainly within the items that we bring back, there will be health colleagues that come to the panel on some of, on some of those items and can address some of those uh, issues. So we will have an update on the mental health services. We'll have an update on integrated commissioning, which will have the integrated commissioners that sit across both health and uh, social care. So um, there'll be an opportunity to, to, to address um, some of those points there, but clearly it's for the panel to decide, not for me, to decide what you cover as a work programme. So if there are changes or suggestions, then that obviously it's the chair uh, to decide. Yes. So. Chair, during the discussions, the issue raised has been turned into something else. So the issue that I'm raising is that the health service does not explain their, um, they do not um, properly explain their financial decisions, nor do they discuss why they've come to them, or even in most cases, who has made the decision where and why. Um, uh, they should do. So that, for example, I raise the example of mental health funding being reduced as a proportion of the overall spend yet again. Um, it is improved this year in that they've actually calculated the amount and put it on their website, which is a, a massive step forward. Um, and it indicates that someone somewhere is, is trying to solve the issue. But um, most health spending in, in the borough is subject to complete lack of scrutiny. Um, so I'm, I'm not asking for Oxleys to come, although I'm sure that will be incredibly useful and, and important. What I'm asking is for the people who make the financial decisions to explain why they do it and, and at what meetings they do it and how the public through their elected representatives or indeed active members of the public who come along to these things can actually influence that. So I, I don't see that in any of these, any of these items. It could be relevant to all of them, but it's, it's certainly been excluded as written here. Uh, I can try. I think, uh, and I do take your points, um, Councillor Morrow. I think, I think it can. I do believe, but maybe it is worth a, a kind of a discussion with uh, the chair and your and yourselves that it can be covered in these reports. I think the other thing that, as well, that is complex is the. The system is complex. I think that is part of the issue. Um, so there will be decisions that will be taken at an ICB level uh, through Greenwich Healthier partnership um, then there'll be decisions that are flowing through health and well-being board etc etc so I think um, as in I'm not saying that we can't discuss them I'm just saying that there uh, is how do we then bring it into the scrutiny environment as well and the timings as well around that I think it could be helpful to uh, potentially do um, a briefing as well on the uh, joint strategic needs assessment and how that's pulled together, because a lot of that is used as a kind of data piece that is worked uh, in, in collaboration with uh, the council and with NHS colleagues on that kind of that data basis, which then decisions are based. So I think maybe starting with that, and then also then thereafter scrutinising the decisions that are being made against that. I think potentially that could be a way forward, but then also I feel you could pick up strands with it within each report as well. But maybe it could be something that is kind of thrashed out in a little bit more detail about if we can achieve kind of what, what the, the board is asking and if that feels like it's kind of hitting the mark 
Um, but I, and I think it's a, a valid request to ask. It's just about how we put it together. Unless the scrutiny committee has changed over a, a, over a period, it is a very powerful body. I mean, it is, I think, one of the few uh, bodies that can actually refer something to the Secretary of State. Um, so therefore, it's a very powerful body, and it can actually um, um, question anything which is, is going to be uh, helpful or, or not helpful to the health and well-being of any of, of, uh, citizens of, of Greenwich. So you can ask anybody on that, and it can ask them to, to turn up and to question them on it. That there is a lack of transparency. On the MSK, it's in incredibly difficult to get, uh, get information on. There's a lack of transparency. I'm surprised, I don't want to have a go, but um, you, you um, actually provided the brief update. Are the council, I mean, the council is picking up the tab for people who uh, will go through MSK, and that they're going to be involved in that because people are immobilized or whatever, I don't know. And so are you, are, through the, we've got now, we've got this, um, uh, uh, what is it, the Healthy Greenwich Partnership or Healthier Greenwich Partnership. I'm assuming that the council with the health, um, health bodies are actually uh, de dealing together with how MSK should be provided, given that it's such an impact on the morbidity of, of people in, in, in Greenwich. It's the biggest section. I'm just uh, amazed. So all strength to you in terms of, uh, of um, pulling people in. I'm sure you're quite capable of uh, uh, summoning anybody who you need to. No, I just wanted to say that I'm one of the people that benefited from MSK because I ha I've had a laminectomy of my spine, um, so I've got pins and rods in my back, and I'm now ha going to have caudal injections under general anaesthetic. So um, it, it, it does work. Yeah. It does work. It was a suggestion on the work programme, Chair, not to change it, don't work as <laughs> such, but to add some things. But perhaps we could indicate somewhere which stakeholders would be attending the ones who we envisage, because we do deal with a lot of external parties. Mm -hmm. And then we could say, actually, we feel there's a gap that we need someone from the ICB there or to summon someone that could answer those questions as they come forth. Yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's something. To, could you note that, please? Um, that's a very important point to note. Um, what I will say is... Um, what I'll say is um, from what um, you've just mentioned, of course, um, we have been told that these things, you can, you can get the information. But I, I think with the, with the agenda that we have for the, the rest of the, the, the months, we ha the, those specific ones, we will indicate to them about the financial implications and whatnot, and for them to come as, as to what is the financial cost on those areas. But I think what you were requesting was something that you wanted the financial, um, you know, transparency as to how the, the 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 whole health and social care is is being financed. And I think that um, if we don't have the people who control that, but it is a different group of people, then we won't get the answers from here. So I think that it is important that when they are coming to make their presentation, especially on the part of um, the preventive side, the public health side, the mental health side, we could make requests of the financial side of those things, yes. Sorry, I just thought it might be helpful to make one point, um, and sorry to be blunt. At the end of the day, the, the work program is controlled by scrutiny. So we will bring what you ask us. I think that's really clear to make, so as in, I think the, the confusion here is I think there could be worth a discussion collectively about what you would like to bring. We will either directly or indirectly with partners bring anything and then that you need to scrutinize. I think the issue is the work plan has been set and I'm trying to work around that. Does, does, does that, and I'm not in control of that work plan. So I'm sorry to be blunt, but I'm just worried that we might be, I, I hear the, 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 the ask. So it's about 
how do I, we want to deliver what this, the panel is asking, but um, I think it might be worth, no, 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 we will, if, um, I, yeah. I'm sorry, when we had this discussion in the, yeah. at the previous meeting, I, I did say it won't happen, and it won't, okay, so it's our money, and it's being spent on health services in the borough, yeah. and no one is allowed to question what they're doing with it, okay? The, the people who make the decisions do not come to public meetings and explain themselves. We as councillors can't find out. Apparently the, the scrutiny panel can hear casework, but we, we, from members of the public who turn up on the night, thank you, sir, um, but we cannot ask about the, amount, about the money being spent on the NHS in our borough. Now, the, I think I'm right in saying that the amount spent by the NHS, the amount of public money spent by the NHS is larger than the amount spent by the council altogether. So you think of all the scrutiny panels that there are in the council. Where is the scrutiny panel for the health service? Nowhere. Now, it, the, the people who are going to come are the same people who come every time, and they say things like, um, oh, it's the council that runs the NHS through the ICBs, you know, and various things like that. But no one in the council has ever seen um, a budget line. We, we, I, I sat in the cabinet. We had discussions about um, what our budget would be. It went on for ages. Um, we all discussed what our priorities were and what we could bear to not provide in order to provide the things that we did. Nothing like that has ever happened with health, um, and nor will it. So um, I, I hear what you're saying, it's scrutiny's programme, but the scrutiny panel was saying we want to hear it and, the pro and the, it won't happen. I don't. Well, look, if, I don't know if we can refer things to the Secretary of State for Health, but if we can, we ought to refer the lack of democratic accountability in the health service across the country to the Secretary of State for Health, because no, nowhere else in the country works any different from this. The, the budget decisions are made by people in, um, in isolation from the democratic processes, and by the way, the Health and Wellbeing Board, which you, which you mentioned, I sat on for four years, and we, we never saw a meaningful decision. We discussed a little bit of casework. Someone brought up and said, oh, and this has happened. Um, but every report was about financial decisions that had already been made six months before. Um, and at, at one point, I said to the leader, I'm going to vote against this paper just because that's the only power I, I have. But th th there is no democratic engagement. <laughs> Good news is this is a scrutiny panel and we can bring anything at all here to discuss. And I'm happy for that to take place. I think, um, Nick, you want to um, make a comment. I mean, it was along those lines, really. I, we, we, we've been, been invited to come to discuss certain items. Yes. You've invited LGT to come along to talk about that, that um, their, you know, their CQC rating. As, as, a sep as an entity in the health space, and I'm sure as a panel you could request South East London ICB to come to talk about um, the allocation of, of funding. So it's not, it's not for, I'm not sitting here to, I can't dictate the work programme, I can only advise, but, the, um, but, but that, that is within the, the, you know, within the, the, the remit, yeah, obviously, remit. of the panel. So, um, but it's, as I say, that, that, that you, you have and you do, and it has happened in the past, that um, providers in the health service have been invited to, take, to give account of themselves outside of the, um, you know, the council. Sorry, when was a budget brought to a scrutiny committee? It hasn't I, happened. I, I wasn't saying that, but what I was right. saying was that, uh, that you, you know, people can be invited, such as you know, a request could be made of... The ICB, the ICB too, yeah. you know, to come. So I think, um, Councillor Morrow, the message is very clear. It is not in here. We'll try to make sure that we, we include it there. And we will, we will, no, no, it is, I mean, we can, we can, we are making a request. I mean, the, the understanding was that um, those ones that are going to be presented on public health, on mental health, they were going to speak about the costing, about, I mean, the, the financial implications about that. But now that we're looking at the whole generality of health funding and that of um, adult social care, we can go to the Integrated Care um, Commission or the Integrated Care Board to be, make sure that they are able to explain some of these things. So we'll find the possibility of where we can put that and then 
um, let everybody be informed about. Yes, um, Councillor Williams. That, thank you, Chair. I, I recall Councillor Morrow at the last meeting saying it's never going to happen, and I asked him to have faith. So please don't, <laughs> please don't let me down on that. And I, my, where I have a concern yeah. is we say we have all this power, but then we are stymied by having to clear it with the chief exec, who is the body that we should be scrutinising. And, and that's, you're telling us we have to clear the work programme with the chief exec. And so we don't have the ability just to summon someone randomly to come and sit here. Yeah. And that's where I struggle with where this joins up. Do we or don't we? Um, the, the only thing I would, I would like to add is, um, just as the chair suggested, it, it can be looked at, and from process standpoint, I think he would have to meet with um, the chair of, chair of ONS, and if they do agree, they could determine whether it comes to this panel or ONS itself. That's the only thing I can add. This is really important. It was minuted at the last meeting that it had to be cleared by the chief exec and the chair of the ONS. Is that the fact or is it not the fact? That is, that is only to vary the work program. That, that, no, if a change to the work program, does it require, if we want to add something to this work program, does the chief exec have to approve it? Uh, yes, in consultation um, with the ONSJ. So that, that will be look that will be look at. I will. I will make my. my, my yes. Yes. Um, Nick, I, go ahead. I think there's a, there's a there's a point around the clearance, but actually the the point around who sets the work program is it's the the scrutiny panel. That that is a, the the point around clearance is 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 the the chair of ONS. Just to add, I think the, this came in at the last meeting. The reference to the chief exec was own, was, and I, I'm not, I think we need to get it as written down, but it was only about, I think, potentially concerns about workload and being able to produce it. It is not being signed off by the chief exec. It is scrutiny panel that decides on the work program. So I think we just need to get our language really clear on that because I think it has caused some confusion. Otherwise, um, is there any other business that somebody wants to say something? Um, thank you for all coming, and especially Frank, uh, Francis, and then um, the, the members who came from, uh, for, to, to ask questions. Um, thank you for attending and for your questions that you asked and the contributions you all made. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>